Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from October 10th to the 16th. Now before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. And there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and then take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. We're going to start with some news from Marijuana Moment as Michigan cannabis sales hit another record in September, reaching $212 million, which we love to see out of another state that recently legalized a few years back. So for the third time in 2022 already, Michigan saw a record-breaking month of cannabis sales reaching 212 million in September state data shows. The state saw 195.3 million worth of adult use cannabis purchases and 16.6 million in medical cannabis sales last month. The total is about 2 million greater than the previous record in July and 17 more, 17 million more sorry, than the earlier April record. As has been the ongoing trend, most of the cannabis purchases for both medical and rec use were for flower products followed by vape cartridges. The data also shows a continuation of a sales trend in Michigan's cannabis market, which is a very relaxed market in terms of giving licenses to open dispensaries compared to other limited licensed states. And so for that reason, we've seen a lot of growth in Michigan. And that is again, the, the beauty of having the experiments of all the different states in the laboratory of democracy with medical cannabis purchases dipping and adult use sales increasing. The first recreational shops opened in Michigan in December of 2019. Meanwhile, Michigan regulators recently announced that they are issuing another round of grants to support research into the therapeutic benefits of cannabis for military veterans using tax dollars the state generated from adult use cannabis sales because now they have so much cash flowing in, they don't know what to do with it. More on what they'll be doing with some of those grants going forward and more on this article, but love to see Michigan crushing sales as Michiganders love their legal pot. And so we've got this one from YouGov America. Most Americans approve of Biden's pardons of federal convictions for cannabis possession. So at least the news from last week was received well. Uh, the decision is popular as well uh, to, in the eyes of the masses as the latest economic YouGov poll. Americans approve of Biden's federal pardons by a margin of 62% to 25, more than three quarters of Democrats, 78% approve, and most independents, 60% also approve. Even Americans who never have tried cannabis are more likely to approve 48% than not 33% of Biden's decision, while Republicans are split 45% approve, 47% disapprove. And so this is just going off of the announcement that he would release people, despite the fact that when you look a bit closer, there are very few, I think, zero people uh, at in prison at the federal level for simple cannabis possession. They either have felonies for trafficking cannabis um, or moving it. But regardless, uh, it gives exposure to the cannabis industry, more positive than negative uh, for the most part, and that's at least what we like to see. But with that, just another report interesting from Marijuana Moment, but Jeremy Burke, who writes for Business Insider Trading, shared this one. As looking into it a bit deeper, the Federal U.S. Sentencing Commission found that Biden's cannabis pardons affect a total of 6,577 U.S. citizens and 1,122 legal aliens. And so this source is the U.S. Sentencing Commission, uh, data from 1992 to 2021. Well, apparently a total of 2,085 cases were excluded from the analysis in this report due to missing information relating to citizenship. So nonetheless, though, interesting enough to find out these are the people affected by his news. And it seems, I think, based on the color being the same, that 1,122 of the resident and legal alien offenders, none of them have actually been in custody. So it seems like they might actually be out of jail and so not actually behind bars or anything. Um, so it's essentially just pardoning whatever they might have been charged for. And so uh, that's what I got out of this. I could be wrong. Let me know uh, down below if you have any more uh, comments on it. But the whole federal report from the U.S. Sentencing Commission will be down there if you wanted to read through it. While we jump back over to states, this one from Todd Harrison. So thanks, Todd, for sharing what Beacon has to say on Michigan cannabis. And so a bit more on this. Uh, we covered some of the sales highlights, but as displayed below, just wanted to highlight uh, one of the benefits of, again, having a more competitive market where they do have a lot of licenses, driving the price down, a lot of different factors. But legal sales continue to track above 2020 and 2021 as it does help their growth. There were 14 new active retailers added in September, bringing the total of 569, which represents a 3% month over month increase in retailers from 555 total dispensary outlets selling legal cannabis, helping directly compete and, you know, get as much as possible, get rid of the illicit market in August. Additionally, the average revenue per retailer was $343,000 in September of 1% month over month 
uh, from 341k in August. So interesting stats, but yeah, nonetheless, more there on Michigan if you wanted to pause to read. With that, we've got this one from Tom Engel. So thanks, Tom, for sharing. New poll finds that 69% of Maryland voters support the cannabis legalization referendum on the November ballot and that the cannabis question makes people more likely to vote, especially black voters and those under 40. And so more on this uh, finding from a poll in Maryland. You can grab the link below, and then there's a snippet here uh, as it analyzes it by race if you uh, wanted to take a look uh, and pause to read this one. So with that, moving on to Florida Office of Medical Cannabis Use, uh, looking at dispens dispensaries approved uh, and open this past week from October 10th to the 14th. We see Sunnyside, uh, backed by Cresco Labs, opening one new one in Pensacola. And so with that, qualified patient counts did increase week over week by a margin of over 2,000, which we do like to see that growth jumping back up a little bit. Uh, this week, uh, qualified patient count is up to 758,526, which represents 2,422 a week over week. So good to see that growth come back, especially as uh, things get back to normal in Florida uh, for any areas that might have been affected um, by the hurricane as well. But with looking at dispensations from October 7th to the 13th, we see all the MSOs listed in the state and their dispensary locations or the number of active dispensaries that they have. And then we can see the number of milligrams of THC sold, milligrams of CBD sold, and ounces of smokable flour sold across the board. And so more uh, a deeper dive into this same information from Candelorian. So thank you for sharing your Florida OMMU report uh, from uh, October 14th, which was yesterday when it did come out. And so this is a summary, essentially, how Florida has been growing over time, I do believe, uh, with patients, dispensaries, THC milligram sales, um, and flower sales ounces. And so this is from the start of 2020 all the way up until now. While this one is more of a breakdown of the uh, MSOs by market share, uh, THC market share, uh, as of this past week, THC milligrams per store uh, for this past week, flower market share for this past week, and then flower ounces per store for this past week as well. And so... Uh, more on the grab this link below if you wanted to check it out for a closer look as well uh, And so with that on to New York Todd Harrison shares this one New York's cannabis rollout needs a bank And there aren't many financial institutions willing or able to service the federal illegal federally illegal industry Well, it seems like if only there was a solution to this like possibly that bill in Congress that they could have voted to pass 18 months ago, but they're still delaying and so uh, it's more on just New York's uh, struggles as they have yet to launch their adult use market that they uh, officially legalized in March of 2021, I believe. So still uh, a lot of incompetence from the regulators in getting this going, but I just wanted to point out the irony of like, yeah, there's so many solutions. You just don't seem to want to apply any of them. Damn Democrats always deceiving. And so with that, Tom Engel sharing today, Nevada regulators are now accepting applications for cannabis consumption lounge licenses. So great to see Nevada getting the ball rolling with this, especially as it will help normalize cannabis and hopefully help stabilize some of their sales. And Nevada is one of the Western markets that's been struggling to, uh, to maintain growth for, for probably a multiple amount of reasons, but most likely a, a competitive list market. Uh, on to some MSO news is True Leaf to open medical cannabis dispensary in Land O Lakes, Florida. And so new dispensary will open October 15th. That is today. Grand opening special is available. So I think this makes number 121 in Florida for True Leaf. So nonetheless, good to see them continuing to expand and establish as much of a dominant footprint in that state of Florida as possible. So more information if you want to pause to read for what they're offering there. And the big news of the week though, which I think a lot of people didn't expect, and I mean, I'm not going to do anything because I don't need the money at the moment, but uh, quite disappointing to hear this as Verano announced his termination of arrangement agreement to acquire Goodness Growth Holdings, Inc. And, and what bombshell news that was for Friday morning is Verano announced that it has terminated the arrangement agreement dated January 31st, 2022 by Verano and Goodness Growth Holdings, pursuant to which the company would have acquired Goodness Growth Holdings. And so uh, what Verano seems to be asking for, why it happened on October 13th, 2022, which was Thursday, Verano provided written notice to Goodness Growth Holdings that it was exercising its termination rights in accordance with the terms of the arrangement agreement based upon Goodness Growth Holdings breaches of covenants and representations in the arrangement agreement and the occurrence of other termination events. And so as a result of the termination, the company further asserted that Goodness Growth Holdings owes the company a termination fee in the amount of $14,875,000 plus the reimbursement of transaction expenses up to $3 million. And so there will be more information apparently on Verano's next conference call about this. And apparently according to the CEO and shareholder, or uh, founder, George Artros, we believe that decision to terminate this arrangement agreement was in the best interest of Verano and our shareholders. And as we work through the termination process, they will provide additional commentary. And so uh, unfortunate black eye again for the industry as another deal does not end up going through. Uh, what does this mean? We really don't know, but I don't believe that Goodness Growth is going to back down without any sort of fight. As the Dales report highlights, what is going on here? Certainly not an amicable, amicable split between Verano and Goodness Growth. 
as this comes from a snippet i don't necessarily know the source but i'm just sharing it through um the dales report goodness growth to commence legal proceedings against verano and so apparently verano's material breaches of the arrangement agreement verano's failure to discharge its obligations there under and verano's breach of the duties of good faith and honest contractual performance are among other things why goodness intends to immediately commence legal proceedings against verano to seek significant damage for uh, all of those things that essentially Vrano might be claiming that Goodness is doing, now Goodness is claiming that Vrano is doing it. So uh, more on this from uh, MJ Biz Daily by Kate Robertson. Goodness Growth vows to take legal action after Vrano scraps cannabis acquisition. So if you did want to learn more, the links will be below if you wanted to read through that. And so yeah, very unfortunate news as someone that would have obviously benefited by owning Goodness Growth shares that would have turned into Verano. And of course, pending whenever we finally get safe or see some sort of uplisting action. But regardless, uh, we will have to, s it will be interesting to see how both Verano and Goodness Growth move on from this one going forward. And so on to some snippets from investment firms. Thanks Todd Harrison for sharing this one. This is Bloomberg on US cannabis IPOs. And it seems pretty uh, clear from here, this statement says it all for companies that have sound business models and want to gain respect over time, essentially describing the tier ones without saying it, they need to be uplisted to get the respect and liquidity they need. So it seems like it's always been about uplisting. Obviously, that's not the case because we've seen these companies run quite a bit before, but that seems to be the, the message Bloomberg is handing out. And so more here if you wanted to read it, pause to read, pause. Pot stocks inch toward U.S. IPOs uh, with Biden's legal review order. And so it's not all bad as obviously the news that we've recently got does lead us to believe we could be closer to uplisting than ever before, as that would be the case. Um, but then there's more BI on uh, U.S. Cannabis Part 2 here, so you can pause to read as well as they underline this. We further, with further clarification and setting of timelines, we anticipate this to be a secular pivot in the cannabis industry rather than a one-time reevaluation. Um, and that might that would obviously be a lot healthier to see consistent growth over time as a lot of these steps sort of unlock versus a quick you know, shoot to the moon. And now, obviously, I wouldn't be bothered if we went to the moon, but it seems like the tone here is, of course, regardless of what happens in the election, the window for cannabis listings won't happen overnight. But progress on the path to public markets for pot producers and sellers already has some looking forward uh, with the next several years. Sucks to hear that, but obviously, we're still in the early innings what the next several years could deliver. So you can pause to read more uh, on that one if you'd like. On to this one from Jeffries on U.S. Cannabis. So thanks, Todd, for sharing this one, essentially highlighting what Jeffries believes uh, could be legislative developments and how they could be critical catalysts to building greater levels of institutional ownership. And so these could be the steps, again, not a once-off, which, again, I'm not going to argue against that. It would be great if we get some sort of sleeper or big announcement like we saw back in 2018 in Canada. But regardless, it seems like they think the steps, um, Jeffries at least is Safe Plus and then TSX uplisting first in Canada. Canada, uh, which would be a big boost as a lot of Canadian pension funds would be able to, to actually invest in these MSOs and fundamentally sound ones would be great investments for them to buy. Then Safe Plus and US uplistings eventually, then rescheduling US uplistings and descheduling US uplistings. So this is all a bit of a pipe dream because we have no idea when this is going to happen and it won't be anytime soon. The least we can ask for is just some sort of Safe Plus after all the broken campaign promises. But I can assure you that at least institutional ownership is not going to be wanting to buy around this time and they'll want to be getting in when things have been cheaper than ever. Um, and despite, you know, growing fundamentals on the ground, especially speaking the tier ones here, not some of the tier twos or tier threes that might run into some debt issues, uh, you know, the longer safe doesn't end up passing. Uh, just we, you'd have to think that smart money is trying to accumulate as much as they can right now. So with that, Jesse Redmond sharing the first page of the first Bank of America research he has seen on cannabis, especially since they've had a bit more of a negative tone towards the, the industry. Wider coverage seems like a good thing, raises awareness and enhances credibility. Um, but as opposed to BA Securities sending out memos saying that uh, you can no longer invest in cannabis companies, it seems like it might be a positive step in the right direction that they are bringing back uh, some coverage as cannabis history made. Now comes the review uh, referencing Biden's cannabis possession pardon move according to them, historic, but authority to alter cannabis schedule and status. U.S. Senate has been a roadblock to cannabis reform, and the DA has rejected rescheduling petitions in recent past. And so a bit of information here on sort of the overall summary of the U.S. market from BA, but if you wanted to take a look. And then with that, thanks to Todd Harrison for sharing, I think, the next few pages of that same report, Bank of America on U.S. cannabis. And so this one, I don't think it's very clear. Uh, you might need to grab a link below, but the case uh, for a regulated rec market, obviously simple at this point in time, but first, tax revenue. Uh, second, enforcement costs, you know, allowing police and them to use resources elsewhere where they don't necessarily need to be looking for cannabis. Third, legalization tends to eliminate or at least greatly reduce illicit market, no doubt. Um, fourth is social justice. 
Fourth should be jobs. Fifth could be social justice. Fifth, sixth is laying out the rules of the road because jobs essentially will be social justice for those that are not able to get uh, jobs. And with that, a bit more. So uh, you can pause to read if you wanted to get the second bit from Bank of America. And with this one, just wanted to share from Dennis Rudev, a quick one from Echelon is the U.S. Senate races to watch. Um, now, I don't try to pay too much attention to polls, but just wanted to highlight this uh, last snippet down here. Should Republicans win the Senate? There may be a stronger push by Democrats to get Safe Banking Plus passed in the lame duck session between November 22nd or 2022 and January 2023. And I've highlighted that. I think a blue wave again would not be ideal because you could see the Dems continuing to stall for another two years if they happen to get into power again. Well, if there did happen to be a red wave, that would probably force the Dems to actually act on something so that they deliver some of the broken campaign promises that they've yet to keep. But despite cannabis, However, there would be other Democratic priorities as well. And so the idea, though, is if the Dems have to get kicked out, then it might force them to act as opposed to getting in again for two years, getting cushy, and again, not getting anything done. We continue to believe safe banking plus passing in such short period of time is possible, but less than a 50% chance. But they're saying there's a chance. So we'll take that for now as we're closer than ever. And so with that, uh, weed ETF, another uh, ETF is hitting the market apparently to compete with MSOS. Uh, and some of the others. Weed ETF now provides concentrated exposure to tier one U.S. multi-state operators, as they should, and it does come with a greatly reduced uh, management expense ratio of 0.39% expense ratio, lowest of all cannabis ETFs. However, the gross expense ratio is 0.75%, and the advisor has agreed to waive the 0.36% of its management fee for the fund until at least April 30th, 2023. So do they think something might be coming on April 20th, 2023? We don't know, but just wanted to point that out. And so as of October 11, 2022, the weed ETF maintained concentrated economic exposure in six MSOs to start. Obviously pretty heavy-handed, but pretty uh, pretty attractive. Cureleaf Holdings, 34.5%. Green Thumb Industries, 20.3%. True Leaf Cannabis, 17.2%. Verano, 14.4%. Cresco, 8.7%. And Columbia Care, 4.2%. And of course, if you're not aware, but Columbia Care and Cresco does have a deal as well. Hopefully they can uh, do a bit of a better job than Verano and Goodness did with their deal and actually close on this one. Um, and so obviously in November, we're looking forward to some sort of news, probably in line with uh, Cresco and Columbia Care's earnings, uh, which we will see next month. And so with that, I just wanted to share this one from Mike of Heights. Another interesting share added to the list. This comes after last week, Terrasend announced the closing of U.S. $45.5 million uh, non-broker debt financing, but at a rate of 12.75%, effectively 13%. Yikes. But so an interesting note you can take a look through if you're interested. Some of these numbers are getting wild in the sector. Uh, their debt maturity schedules. Growth at all costs is about to cost a lot. So you know, strap up. These are turbulent times. Stick with the cash flowing names. You'll sleep like a baby. And so it essentially just highlights um, when the their debt is maturing, the issuer, so the MSO that has the debt, and the principal outstanding amount, and then terms and notes, uh, non-amortizing unless otherwise noted. So just a bit of a, an education in finance and how companies work. Obviously, they want to raise equity, they want to raise debt too, different options that you have, um, but it goes through all of them and uh, how much that they owe. And so it's just very, it's an interesting read if you wanted to grab the link below. Uh, and so a few other ones, maturing, issuer, principal outstanding, uh, and this comes from Beacon Securities Companies Reports. And so yeah, link is below if you wanted to check that out. And last few stories, this one from uh, one of our favorite German sources, Alfredo Pasquale, uh, just highlighting that public health insurance coverage of medical cannabis in Germany reached the highest it's ever reached, 96 million euro in the first half of 2022, up 7% uh, from the first half of 2021, and 1% more than the second half of 2021. And so these numbers include only what was reimbursed by statutory health insurers, private prescriptions aren't included. And so this is, seems to be like what is coming from um, public. And so with that, more information, reimbursement of medical cannabis in the German statutory health insurance system, um, broken down by how people are digesting or choosing to consume their cannabis. And so last few stories with that, MJ Biz Daily sharing how Biden's rescheduling of cannabis could affect the U.S. industry. And so a good summary in this one by Chris Roberts, just highlighting so what some of the options are. And so I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I will bring you through it and then let you pause to read. So if the status quo remains the same, essentially keeping the same bullcrap um, background of the history and how it even got set in the first place. Um, but this would be the business impact, essentially the same. It, this is what we've been operating under for a while. And so schedule two, pharmaceutical model background business impact. You can pause to read. What would happen if it was moved to schedule three or four? Tax relief, but it still remains under doctor's orders. Um, but I doubt that that would inflict with the states that have already legalized um, because obviously states' rights should supersede federal rights. Um, so you can pause to read with that. Um, and then Schedule 5, over-the-counter or unscheduled. Obviously, what we would want the most is descheduled, um, but a bit more information on that if it was moved to Schedule 5. 
And then the upshot, a bit more here if you just wanted to pause to read for a summary of this article. And so last few ones, just wanted to share this resource from MJ Stock Trader. And while I haven't actually watched this one yet, I did just want to include it because I do respect MJ Stock Trader as someone in the industry that shares his thoughts a lot. Um, not necessarily that they're always accurate, but he does provide a great resource in his website too. Um, and so with that tier one and two MSO balance sheet and fundamentals review, bit of education if you want it. Um, and obviously just take it with what you already know as well. Um, but main thing is while I try to cover as much of what's happening in the States uh, and on the ground in the US, which obviously just helps me remember that no matter what, it's just a matter of when, not if, that this is all slowly gonna happen and cannabis will finally get its day. Uh, this is just another reminder why the tier ones especially are solid companies, um, you know, and despite having both hands up tied behind their backs, they're operating as effectively as they possibly can. Um, and it's pretty damn impressive uh, nonetheless. And so hopefully that does highlight most of it, uh, but I am gonna check this one out later tonight. And so with that normal, uh, we've got another study as cannabis associated with improved sleep in adults with post-traumatic stress. And so I just wanted to share this one out of Israel. The use of cannabis prior to bedtime is associated with perceived improvements in sleep in subjects diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, according to data published in the Journal of Anxiety Disorders. And so another study obviously backing how cannabis could have medical applications and why we ought to deschedule it U.S. first and then the rest of the world will follow so we can look into the therapeutic and medical benefits, but Israeli researchers assess the impact of cannabis on sleep in a cohort of 77 PSD patients. Study participants kept a daily journal where they recorded numerous sleep measures each morning, and investigators acknowledged that the use of cannabis was associated with self-reported improvements, and regardless of self-reported, still, if you're the one consuming it and you're the one being able to say, hey, my experience is now better because I can use cannabis now or because I can switch and use cannabis from something else, that should be all that matters in sleep onset and a reduction in the frequency of nightmares. Um, and so good effects so far as subjects who consume products higher in CBD, surprisingly, uh, were less likely to report early awakenings or waking up. You might think that it was high THC that would cause people to sleep longer, uh, but seems like it was a high CBD. And so with that bit more information, but the data suggests that medical cannabis may help reduce nightmares and that CBD in particular may be important for preventing early awakenings and helping people sleep through their, you know, the entire sleep cycle. They wrote, this provides a strong basis for further hypothesis testing, potentially through clinical trials of the sleep inducing effects of cannabis and testing for CBD in particular. So a bit more information if you wanted to pause to read, but that is it for today's episode, folks. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions and i'd be happy to address them but besides that if you enjoyed this video and you learned something please just leave a like on it subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos and i will catch you on wednesday for a midweek update have a great week everybody